Hi, Amara. Welcome to the Integrative Health Coach Success Podcast. Hi, thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Yes, we're excited to have you. Um, and I'm looking forward to kind of diving into our topic. Um, although something that we all know a lot about and talk about often, uh, I think there's always ways to kind of uniquely approach it. So I'm looking forward to, to your take on um, all things gut health. But what we'll do to start is um, what I would love for you to share with the listeners is kind of what you're currently doing with your IHP certification. And then we can talk a little bit about maybe what you were doing before that and how you um, transitioned to kind of doing mostly um, the the functional side of things. Sure. Yeah. So I started my business about um, months ago, actually, and just been helping mostly premenopausal women with all things gut health related, which also, you know, impacts hormonal health. Um, And it's been great. I, you know, kind of help them with things from bloating to joint pain, to autoimmune issues, to things like skin rashes, bowel irregularity. So just all encompassing gut health, helping them lower their stress, kind of watch out for toxins, you know, toxin mitigation and educate them on toxin exposure, as well as, you know, the, the foundational things like diet and exercise. So bringing all those things together, I create a plan for my clients. And um, typically it's a 12 week program. And then they usually extend on after on a monthly service because a lot of the time there's more things to address and it takes a little bit longer than 12 weeks. Yes. Yeah. I totally agree. Usually the 12 weeks is a good, like a bite size amount Mm -hmm. of time for like the client to wrap their head around. But yeah, I would say nine out of 10 clients of, of, you know, mine and, and Equalize that, you know, they sign up for 12 weeks. It usually extends beyond that because once you get in there and you get working on things, it's like, okay, that popped up and now we'll address that. And, you know, you just kind of keep peeling back the layers. So yeah, it oftentimes yeah. can take on a, a, a longer life uh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good kind of commitment. You know, it's that 12 weeks and then they kind of build up their trust and their confidence in themselves. Like I can do this. And then we keep working together. So yes. I've loved that approach. hmm Yeah, absolutely. Um, So what were you doing before um, IHP? Have you always kind of been in more of like the health health and wellness, you know, mindset field? Uh, Give us a little bit of an idea about what you were doing before that and kind of what made you transition. Yeah. So right before I was on personal training, I actually got certified right when the pandemic started. So it kind of put a little bit of a you know, um, slow down on things. Um, but even before that, I was always super interested in the health and wellness field. I started to go to the university of Arizona for health and science, health sciences, um, was trying to go to the route of nursing, but then I realized that I liked the more holistic approach to things. Um, so I've worked in service industry. I've worked in real estate, just kind of all over the place. Um, I'm kind of a spontaneous person and decisive sometimes, but I've always seen myself come back to this holistic area. Yeah. And that's how, you know, that's kind of where you're, you know, meant to, meant to be to some capacity is where you kind of always um, come back to when you were personal Mm -hmm. training. Did you find that um, at least a lot of people that, that listen to this show regularly know that I also started in personal training and actually, I mean, Dr. Cabral had a background Mm -hmm. in personal training. It's kind of like this very um, palatable way to get into just helping people get well. But I think what I found was there were so many of my clients who like just putting them through a workout wasn't going to cut it. And yes, I was doing like nutrition recommendations, but you know, we were, I was finding myself talking to clients and almost like being, you know, more of like a depression and anxiety source of like support. And, you know, they would be, you know, crying that they're, they're, they always feel bloated, even though they're doing the workouts at home and like, their clothes still don't fit. And, you know, there was so much more to it. Um, I finally realized, Mm -hmm. and that was kind of what propelled me into, you know, looking deeper and knowing that I could be of service to people, um, to such a greater degree. If I kind of went into that more IHP space too, did you find that when you were training? Yeah, absolutely. I just kind of felt like I was only helping in a small area. Um, and a lot of the clients needed so much more support than just exercise. They needed an overhaul with their body. They needed somebody to help with stress. They needed somebody to help with their diet. So I started thinking, you know, maybe there's something else that I can do that would be a little bit more all encompassing. And as you know, like in today's world, there's so many diet fads all over the place and quick fixes. And a lot of people struggle with these because they want, you know, they're 
their um, results to come fast. And it's not always the case. So I think kind of going into the integrative health where we look at the body as a whole was super, super helpful. And I just, you know, when you start to go into personal training and you start to get that, um, not as excited as you normally would, because you know, you can help and provide so much more support to people. So same kind of experience as you had and probably as Dr. Cabral as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, you know, so much that can be done that's positive, but then like, there's just like that kind of stopping, stopping block, unless you're, you're doing further education. So yeah, I totally agree. Um, what would you kind of share? So it, um, sounds like your main focus is gut health and, Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like you're working mostly with women. I'm curious if you have kind of these three, you know, big tips or three kind of areas, uh, either tips or, you know, areas that you'd like to focus on as Mm -hmm. far as uh, helping women to either, you know, heal their gut, um, but also, you know, is it attached to, you know, stress or hormones or Mm -hmm. what are kind of your um, three biggest gut, you know, parameters, if you will? Yeah. So definitely number one, I think would be managing stress because no matter the protocols you're on and the supplements you take and the diet you're on, whatever it may be, if you're not managing your stress and your body's constantly in that fight or flight state, it's going to be very hard for your body to heal. Um, so, and that can be external stress, you know, whether it's work related or relationship related or internal stress, you know, and that would kind of go into that second, um, you know, aspect of gut health, which would be healing the gut, getting rid of any pathogens or imbalances, um, and targeting, you know, and restoring the gut, um, adding back in beneficial bacteria, um, you know, and that directly helps with your mental health as well. Cause if you don't have the right bacteria, you're not going to be producing the right neurotransmitters. You're not going to be making the right vitamins or absorbing and, and digesting those either. So I think those are the, the top two. And then, you know, kind of one thing that I wanted to mention in regards to stress as well is being present when you're eating, because a lot of us are in this go, go, go society where we're just eating on the go. We're eating and we're rushing. We barely have time to sit down and eat and our body we don't, we're not giving it the chance to actually get in that parasympathetic state and properly rest, you know, and digest those, those foods properly. So those are like the top two. Um, and, you know, obviously in that second one of rebalancing the gut, there's so many things that go into that, but, um, also, you know, adding in, you know, good nutrition. So, you know, less inflammatory foods, less processed foods, you know, you go to the grocery store, almost everything's in boxes nowadays. Um, Mm -hmm. So getting back to those whole foods, balanced meals, which will also help with balancing your blood sugar. um, And that helps with stress levels as well, um, anxiety. So I think those are definitely the top three that I work with my clients. Yes. Yeah. The stress is so huge. I, we talk about Mm -hmm. it all the time um, in the sense that if you can do all the things um, and what, where I see kind of stress usually cause like the biggest issue is in like relapses because typically, you know, a client will be really committed at first and they're doing like, you know, the nutrition plan and they might be using antimicrobial supplements and, you know, they're doing all the things, but people who kind of continue to have ongoing gut-based issues, the one thing that they usually have in common is higher levels of stress, usually Mm -hmm. external, if you've gotten, you know, rid of the internal stressors, And the external stuff just causes, like you said, if you're not breaking down your food properly and you're always stuck in that sympathetic nervous system dominance, well, Mm -hmm. that undigested food is going to ferment and it's going to feed, you know, other yeast bacteria. Um, It's going to cause inflammation. It's going to cause bloating. And so Mm -hmm. I feel like stress is usually one of those things too, that kind of causes the relapses. um, Yeah. In gut. hundred percent. Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. I see that a lot with clients that all of a sudden start to plateau. We start to look at their lifestyle and they're like, well, yeah, my stress level is a seven out of 10. It's like, okay, well, what can we do to kind of mitigate that on a daily basis? And I love Dr. Brawl's like three non-compromises, you know, picking three things out of the day that you do, whether it's, you know, five to 10 minutes of just getting back into that parasympathetic nervous system state, allowing your body to heal. And then rest is so crucial you know, people going to bed at different times of day, waking up at different times of the day, we need a sleep routine. That's not only crucial for gut health, but hormonal health, mood, everything. And when we're sleeping, that's when our 
lymphatic system is draining to the, draining the most. That's when we're really doing that deep cleaning and getting rid of those toxins. So rest is huge with my clients and I cannot stress it enough, you know, a, a bedtime of around 10 PM and, and a wake up time around six to eight, depending, but getting an, you know, an average of seven to 10 hours a night of rest is so important. And, you know, without that supplementation is only going to do so much if you're not resting and you're not, you know, managing those stress levels. Yes. Yeah. I completely agree. So with the stress, um, mm-hmm. you've just said, you know, resting and making sure that you're sleeping. What's another thing that you kind of focus on with your clients as far as, um, helping them to manage stress. And if we, we talk more about like external factors, um, and yeah. if it's women specifically, is there something that's kind of like more women focused, um, yeah. along with the resting? Absolutely. I mean, exercise is huge, getting outside, getting fresh air, but, you know, exercise, you know, listening to your body and not just going to these hit interval classes where you're just adding more stress in your body consistently. You know, I've, with my clients, I see the most beneficial thing is just walking, getting a good amount of steps in per day. It doesn't have to be 10,000, but getting enough steps in the day. Also, while you're outside getting some sunshine and then, you know, just doing some weight training. I feel like that is like the best plan for a lot of my clients, especially that are, you know, experiencing so much fatigue. The last thing you want to do is overstress the body with a bunch of HIIT workouts and a lot of, you know, high intensity workouts, high, you know, heavy weight lifting, those type of things. But another one that I always recommend is meditations. It's one thing that helped me in my own healing. Um, I do guided meditations daily and I recommend it for my clients, but whether they either choose those or they choose, you know, some journaling methods or yoga or, um, you know, even listening to a funny podcast or their favorite music or some binaural beats while you, while you sleep or rest or even eat lunch. There's so many things that you can do and, you know, it's all bio-individual, like whatever somebody likes and prefers over the other. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, a lot of this stuff we have to be like super mindful of, right? I think a lot of a lot of us, if we just like went through our day on autopilot, we would do nothing but like (laughs) the busy tasks and the stressful things. And, you know, a lot of these women are moms, they're, you know, dealing with kids and schedules and drop-offs and this and that. Um, I think it really takes a a good amount of like mental work and planning to say like, okay, these are my three non-negotiables. This is what I'm going to build into my day, or this is where my workout's going to fall. And I'm going to be intentional with it based on how Mm -hmm. I feel and not just like mindlessly go through a class that's, you know, going to wear me down instead of, you know, build me up. So I think for so many people, the coaching aspect in that sense is so important because having somebody to kind of say, okay, this is, these are the things that we need to prioritize. Let's figure out how we can prioritize them so that you actually do them. Because I think like we can kind of just like all think like, yeah, that, that all sounds like a good idea. But then the next day comes and we just are on autopilot and we go through the day and none of it yep. gets done. No, absolutely. I think awareness is one of the, the most crucial things just overall in our society, <clears throat> being aware of our habits, being aware of our thoughts, you know, because those thoughts that we have in our head, our brain doesn't know if it's actually happening now or if it's not. So, you know, those thoughts directly impact our gut health all the time. So um, just being aware, like you were saying, is so, so important. Yes. Yeah. And the awareness also brings us kind of you know, closer to the behaviors that will then give Mm us, um, better results. I was actually just recently talking to somebody about an application. Um, I think it's an app called Nuverna or I'm going to completely butcher it. I can actually look it up, but it's, (laughs) it's actually, a like guided meditation specifically for Mm. digestion. And now I'm going to find it because it's going to aggravate me. If I don't, the Nerva app, but okay. I've heard it, of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, I mean, and that whole like gut brain connection of, you know, even having like the thought of like my food is nourishing, it's being digested properly. The nutrients are being absorbed. I mean, mm-hmm. forget it. Most people are just like rushing through, like, you know, standing up eating or like grabbing things on the go. Um, and it's so far from what nature intended our yeah. you know, meal times and digestion to look like. 
Absolutely. And I feel like, you know, especially us with us women, we have these, you know, societal standards of how to look and we're constantly overthinking what we're eating. You know, is this, is this meal, you know, sometimes the meal itself is going to, even if it's an inflammatory meal, the stress of thinking about the meal will actually do more damage of eating that meal itself. So, and I see that a lot with my clients and I've even struggled with some, you know, more eating disorder habits in my past and starting to listen to the body, get in tune with the body and just focus on balance. The meals has been so helpful for my clients, um, you know, a healthy protein, a healthy carb. And I even am a little bit funny with the word healthy because even that can be taken and, you know, misconstrued, but, um, basically, you know, I like to use less nutritious or more nutritious a lot of the time. So more nutritious, you know, carb and, and protein and fat source. And one thing I wanted to mention too, was we we're so, um, when we wake up in the morning, we just want to have our cup of coffee right away. Well, what Mm -hmm. that's doing is increasing our blood sugar right already when it's starting to increase our cortisol starting to increase. And then we wonder why we're crashing in the afternoon. So I really stress having a breakfast before drinking coffee or even like a smoothie, which I recommend a lot with my clients because it helps that energy levels um, throughout the day. Yes. And I always say the amount of, if you can change the amount of voluntary stress you place on Mm -hmm. your body, then the involuntary stuff that like is really hard for us to control doesn't, you know, cause as much of a, doesn't wreak as much havoc essentially as if we were doing all the involuntary stuff. So to your point, you know, drinking coffee on an empty stomach and then getting a flat tire Well, you're going to respond way different to the stress of getting that flat tire. If you've balanced your blood sugar, if you've had something to eat, if you're not running on cortisol and adrenaline, um, your mood will be more stable. Your response will be more, you know, logical. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like in our world, we're always so overstimulated. There's always things that are, you know, whether it's technology or, you know, stressful situations at home or at work. And it's really in our control. And what we have to do is, is really try to implement those stress management techniques throughout the day. And it takes time, you know, with any habit, it takes time of, you know, maybe with working with a coach first and, and having them help you kind of build that routine into your life. And then after, what do they say? 21 days, you make a habit. So after some time, it starts to become natural, just like how, you know, the place, you know, all the things that got us to where we are in this unhealthy state, all of those habits, we kind of have to unlearn. So it's, it's a lot of, you know, effort and it's time, but I always remind my clients, what, why did you start in the first place? Yes. Yeah. And again, the time that it takes, you know, I always say like, Oh, you know, time is this people always say like, I don't have enough time. I don't, we Mm -hmm. all have every single person gets up with Mm -hmm. the same 24 hours in the day. Um, And oftentimes it's just a matter of being super intentional, aware, uh, and structuring it in a way that is more beneficial than depleting, or there's so many ways that you can kind of make it make the, you know, your time, the time work in your favor rather than having like all of these, you know, things just kind of suck, suck the energy and the life out of you throughout the day. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and you know, it's a gradual process too. Like you can't just like, like adopt all these new habits at once. It takes time. And, you know, going back to what I said earlier about everybody wanting a quick fix and their results to come quick, it's just not realistic. Quick results usually, um, you know, or quick fixes usually are long lasting results. So it really does take time to adopt all those strategies. Um, and that's what having a coach is great for, because they can kind of hold your hand throughout the process and, and, you know, give you that support that you need. <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. And I think much like kind of protocols, like we, you know, we subtract in steps, you know, we get rid of microbes, we get rid of, you Mm -hmm. know, um, candida and bacteria, we get rid of heavy metals and we kind of subtract in steps. I always sit, tell clients like we, uh, we can add in steps too, right? Like you don't Mm -hmm. need to like, just like, we're not going to get rid of yeast, candida, heavy metals, mold, and parasites all in the first, you know, 10 weeks. Yeah. You're not going to add in all the really great stuff in a short amount of time, but just implementing one thing. Okay. We've mastered that. Now let's add in, Mm -hmm. you know, this. And oftentimes, sometimes it's like, we're working through the process, then other things reveal themselves too, right? Oh, Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Actually, 
your digestion's much better when you aren't doing, you know, eating at your desk. Okay. So now like there's no more eating at your desk and we try to, you know, th- there's so many things yeah. that tend to reveal themselves. Do you find that like, as you're implementing some of these steps, the clients find out what's working, you find out what's working and you kind of build on that success. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And sometimes things will appear that you, like you said, you didn't know that were there. Sometimes you'll start to have symptoms of something else and you're like, okay, wait, these symptoms are kind of, you know, presenting as maybe possible mold exposure. So then we start to look deeper. I just had this with a client recently and then she finds some mold growth underneath her kitchen sink and then some in the drywall. And I was just suspecting of this mold, but those things, sometimes they start to just come over time. Um, and you know, you can be really aware of like new environments that you move in. And if you're feeling better when you leave the house versus when you're there, but, um, it definitely things appear, you know, up over time. And, and sometimes, you know, it takes longer to address a bacterial overgrowth or parasitic infection for some people than others. So like the, the, path for someone's healing process is very different than another person's. And I think the most challenging thing to accept is that that process is not linear. Um, it is not a linear process of healing. There's going to be ebbs and flows to it. Um, and it's just a learning journey for everybody in, in, you know, involved. Yes. Yeah. And I think much like it's hard for a client to accept that it's not a linear process. I think mm-hmm. sometimes us as coaches, you know, we can kind of be so, um, you know, performance driven or like success when we want to see things kind of like work as they're supposed to, um, what do you find as kind of like one, like if what, what's an emotion that sometimes comes up for you? Like, obviously we have a lot of coaches listening. Mm -hmm. Is there like one specific emotion that comes up with for you? If like clients have big setbacks or, you know, they're not moving in this like direct word, you know, direct upward process. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, self-doubt for me, number one, I mean, that was something that even, you know, prevented me from starting for so long in the first place is that self-doubt creeps in and you're like, can I really help this person? Um, and when they start to have those setbacks, you're like, wait, do I really have the knowledge and the experience to help them? Um, and I think that's one of the most common things, obviously frustration is in there as well, but it's more of frustration that it, it, isn't happening, you know, faster because we all want those quick results. But I think self-doubt is probably one of the main ones for myself and I'm sure for other coaches too. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's so important for us to keep in mind that even our own health journeys, right? Like Mm we, you know, my healing journey was not linear yet. Mm -hmm. I had complete (laughs) trust in the people that were helping me through it. Right. And so that client is probably having way more trust in you than, you know, you might feel in that moment, like you're feeling self-doubt, but they might be like, okay, Mm -hmm. like what do we do next? And so keeping in mind that you still, I always um, say, because Dr. Cabral always told me this early on, he would say, always remember that even if you don't know everything, you're still the expert in the situation. Mm -hmm. The client does not know as much as you, you have more knowledge to help and guide and inspire them. And so that's what you'll do. If you need to draw on more education or more support from somebody Mm -hmm. who knows more than you, fine, but you are still fully capable of helping the client through what they're going through because without you, they know far less than if they were with you. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things I learned early on myself was that we that have gone through these extensive healing journeys we're actually the best people to help other people with their own healing journeys because we've been through it ourselves, you know, just like somebody that works with, you know, mental health or works with addiction, who are the best people to help them? Somebody that's struggled with that mental health disorder as well, or somebody that's struggled with addiction. So I think it really, really translates. Um, and, you know, since we've gone through the journey, we can also remind them, you know, I went through my own journey and it wasn't linear either. And we shouldn't expect that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yes. And being relatable, I think is Mm -hmm. creates a lot of trust, you know, in those moments of, you know, I've been there, I got to the other side, you're there, I'm going to help you get to the other side. And, you know, having that relatability and that trust factor um, can be so important with, you know, how the client feels in those moments of maybe they're doubting themselves, or they're doubting their own body's ability to heal. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they're looking, you know, for, for some sort of 
thing to trust, right? Um, and I think a lot of times we might think that kind of like being the, you know, epitome of perfection and is actually mm-hmm. the most inspiring, but it's my belief that being super relatable and super, you know, vulnerable sometimes in, in a way is what clients feel like they can kind of latch onto and trust. Absolutely. I mean, we're in a world of like perfection. Well, it seems like perfection. You go on social media and these people's lives look perfect, but they're truly not. And so I absolutely agree that being relatable and having that space for them to come to and actually listen, because in a lot of, you know, um, other medical areas, you don't really get that sort of support. You don't really get to actually talk and have them listen as much as in our area where it's more holistic. Yes. Yeah. Such a good point is, uh, people say all the time. And I think even, you know, all of us IHPs who maybe went through a journey before finding holistic practices would agree that the number one thing that's missing in conventional care is connection. And when you don't have that connection, you don't have, you know, more than 10 minutes with somebody even listening to, I mean, what can you describe in 10 minutes that that's kind of where you feel like, okay, does anybody care? I'm kind of in it on my own. And the connection piece is really where people um, can truly heal, in my opinion, um, when they feel like they're connected and supported and understood too. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, your health is, you know, super, super important when you go into those, you know, just traditional doctor's offices and, you know, they try to just prescribe you something which adds more symptoms onto the problem. And then they also don't give you that support. And like you said, allow you to feel heard. Um, It can also make the client or the patient not feel like, well, maybe I, maybe there isn't anything wrong. Maybe if they don't care about my health, why, why do I care about my health? Like, maybe I am just fine. And then you start to get that doubt in your head. Maybe I'm crazy. Like exactly. That. So many people, you know, say, yes. oh God, I felt like I was losing my mind for years. Or like the doctors were like, maybe you should see a psychiatrist. And <laughs> yes, that has happened to me actually. Um, yep. I went in and they had just referred me to go to CBT therapy. So, um, and then turns out, you know, I had all these other problems that were diagnosed with or, you know, not diagnosed, but that were seen by functional labs and seen by other holistic practitioners. And then you start to realize, okay, I wasn't losing my head. (laughs) Like I actually was, you know, we, we listen to our bodies and we're so in tune with our bodies. We know when something's off. And I think Mm -hmm. that's so important is just to continue to listen, right? Those symptoms are just red flags that something is off in the body. It's the way the body's communicating to us. We aren't listening. They're going to ramp that up. They're going to turn up the signals. They're going to increase the symptoms until we really look back and say, okay, maybe there is something wrong. And sometimes that just takes a whole other approach, which is what made me go into holistic um, health as well. I had my own extensive journey of not knowing what's going on with me for 10 plus years. And I was, you know, debilitating anxiety, depression. I had POTS, I had IBS, I had vertigo, I had a TBI, all these things. And I started to think, okay, well, these are just labels you know, over these symptoms, what is causing that individual symptom? What's causing the bloating? I don't have IBS. That's just irritable bowel syndrome. What's actually causing the bloating? What's causing those bowel irregularities? You look deeper and then you find the answers to that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, IBS is the best because it's like, they basically are telling you they're diagnosing you with what you're coming in, telling them you're most people who come into a doctor's office are like, I, my gut is not right. I either, maybe they have gas, maybe they have bloating, maybe they have loose stool, maybe they have a constipation, they have an irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we know what you have. It's irritable bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome. And <laughs> yeah. you're like, thank you very much. I came in actually telling you that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so, it's so true. And then they'll give you a prescription and usually doesn't help at all. It actually makes things worse. Um, so we always have to look to, you know, as we say, the root cause, what's the root cause or causes of what's causing that symptom in the first place. Um, and with IBS, woo, stress is a big one. Stress is a big one. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the, the IBS stuff, as it ties into, you know, the, the gut function in and of itself, um, there's so much that kind of, you know, can be this never ending loop of like the inflammation and the stress and the poor Mm -hmm. digestion, which then leads to overgrowth. And then the overgrowth leads to more inflammation. Right. And it's like this never ending loop. And if you don't kind of 
find somewhere to, to break the cycle, um, it can kind of be, yeah, you're, you're just spinning your wheels. Um, but that's obviously where root cause analysis comes into play and and helps to a great degree. Yeah, absolutely. It can be absolutely life-changing for people when they actually know the reason and and those causes to their health concerns. And it actually provides them a sense of, holy crap, like there was something wrong with me and I wasn't just in my head. And it's just that validation. And so many of us need that validation. We just want to feel understood. Um, Mm -hmm. And those, those labs and then working with a practitioner can look at your symptoms and put everything together and, you know, all those puzzle pieces together and say, this is what's going on. And this is what we need to work on rather than a prescription and shoving you out the door. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I've had so many clients like just break down, like they start crying and it's not that the, like that they hear that they have yeast or candida, or they hear that they have a hormonal imbalance. Like it's not that information that's making them cry. They literally are so relieved that they've actually found to be true what they've been, what they've known all along. I think one of just society, like we don't need to, you know, not conventional medicine. I think it's just society in general has completely, um, I think seared us away from trusting our own mm-hmm. intuition, our own power, our own, you know, whether it be as a mother, whether it be as just a female in general, whether it be as a man, as, you know, masculinity, I think society's kind of pushed us into this, you know, more dependent, you know, mm-hmm. less self-thinking and we can kind of get into this pattern of like, do I, I guess I don't know what I'm feeling talking about. Like, yeah, you know what? I'm probably am crazy. There's nothing wrong with me. Like I'll just take the prescription and I'll be better. Right. And sometimes that can be like so much emotion to shove down. And I think so many people are completely unaware. They're unconscious that, that this is happening. But then when someone validates maybe what they've subconsciously felt and known for years, it's kind of this like flood of emotion of oh my gosh, like I knew that I knew that something wasn't yeah. right and it's being validated. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think it can be really challenging for the families of these people that are, have all these health struggles too, because they start to think, wait, what is actually going on here? Maybe it is in their head. And then you start to have family and friends start to question that's happened to me as well. Old coworkers, you know, just questioning, why is she getting dizzy all the time? You know, why is this happening? And then you start to, you know, kind of self-isolate yourself a little bit. So it's super important to be in tune with your body as, you know, and it takes time. It takes practice because we're so far away from that. Um, but you know, like I said, listening to those symptoms that you're, they're just truly red flags. Yes. Yeah. And they're, they're your survival techniques. Your, your body is the symptoms are literally trying to get you to understand that there's something that needs attention. Um, Mm -hmm. But like I said, I feel like we we're in a society of like such numbing, like it's just like, watch this to take your mind off that or drink this and, you know, smoke that. Like there's just so many ways to numb ourselves. And I think that people don't even realize they're doing it. Like it's not even a conscious thought. It's just so many societal norms that people go through to just mask whatever, you know, symptom may be happening. Because let's face Mm -hmm. it, like anxiety and depression are a symptom. And it's been so normalized of like, you know, just like have your glass of wine at night. And I'm not saying like there's anything wrong with that. But if you need, a drink or two to feel calm at night, well, maybe you're deficient in magnesium or maybe there's an Mm -hmm. adrenal-based issue, right? It doesn't have to be like this big problem to solve, but I think we've gotten so used to using external things to kind of numb potential imbalances that it's just kind of become, you know, out of sight, out of mind. No, absolutely. I like, there was one quote by the holistic psychologist who I love. Um, and yeah. she always talks about how you get in your rocket ship and you escape reality. We all have our certain escapes and vices that we use. And it's almost frowned upon when you don't have one of those going out with, you know, in public or going out. And, you, and if you say, no, I don't want to drink. Well, why don't you want to drink? It's fine. Like and misery loves company too. Right. I always say that. Um, so that's been something challenging with me is I've never really liked to drink very much at all. So when I go out and people are always questioning and they make you feel bad and they guilt you into doing it because they want you to be on their level as well. 
And it's not a, it's yes. not a bad thing, but it's just, you know, it's conditioned behavior. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. That analogy is great. And I've seen like other things of like the, the alcohol thing is one of those things where I feel like it, no, like you don't question anything else in the same way, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, you're not putting mayonnaise on your sandwich, but you're putting mayonnaise on your sandwich. Or like, you're not even like, you're not going to eat bread. How come you're not eating bread? Like, oh, you must just like have a gluten allergy, right? Like there's so many mm-hmm. things that abstaining from are a little bit yeah. more normal. And it's like, alcohol is one of those things where like, you're not drinking, but are you pregnant? Are you on antibiotics? Like what's mm-hmm. the problem? <laughs> yeah. Um, And oftentimes you're right. It can kind of be, I think people subconsciously can kind of have a little bit of like their own insecurity about how much they're consuming or why they're consuming. And it's like, Mm -hmm. unless everybody else around them is doing the same, it's kind of, yeah. And maybe not like the, they might not be miserable, but they might be, you know, coping, coping loves company. (laughs) Yeah. 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 No, exactly. Exactly. It feels feels better to know that everybody else is kind of in the same rocket ship. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Um, so you just mentioned, um, the holistic psychologist for, for, so for people that don't um, know her, her name's Mm -hmm. Nicola Perla. And, Mm -hmm. um, I typically will ask, um, my guests if they have kind of like specific podcasts that they love or books that Mm -hmm. they love authors. Um, so we talked about her, she definitely, um, has, A lot. I think she, you know, ties gut health into, you know, anxiety and depression. She's kind of more of like a trauma specialist, yeah. but I think a lot of what she teaches can definitely tie into how our, our guts affected. Do you have other yeah. um, like podcasts that you love authors, um, Instagram accounts that kind of talk about the whole like stress gut relationship? Yeah. I think one of my favorite that I was reading recently was activate your vagus nerve, um, by Dr. Oh goodness. I think it's Naviz Habib. I hope I didn't butcher that name, but, um, that is his, his book. It is amazing. Um, talks all about vagal nerve exercises and how our vagus nerve, you know, it's connected to all, all of all organs in our body. And most of that signaling comes from our gut. So if our gut's imbalanced, we're not getting that proper signaling to the rest of our body. Um, I love that one. I love, um, you know, power of now, um, you know, those type of presence books, um, as far as Instagram accounts go, there's a lot that I follow. Um, Life is Jen. She's great with hormones. Um, she's a FDNP. I love her account. Um, there's, oh my goodness, there's so many, so many holistic yeah. accounts. Um, but if somebody's wanting to, you know, search for them, just, you know, searching tags like holistic health or gut health, and they'll pop up tons and tons of things, um, yeah. accounts like that. And as far as podcasts go, you know, I'm such a, I'm, I love crime podcasts. So I, I listen to a lot more crime podcasts than I do actually um, gut related or health podcasts, but I love um, Dr. Cabral's podcast. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks for sharing those. <laughs> um, if people are wanting to kind of find out more about you, where do you show up on social media? Um, do you have a website, any places that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. My website is healingrootswellness.online. So that goes over all of, you know, the about me, my services and coaching, what I offer. And then I have a more main presence on Instagram. That's healing.roots.wellness. Um, I post a lot on there, a lot of stories, a lot of educational content. And I do weekly, like name your symptom and I'll tell you the possible root cause or causes of it. Um, so that's one thing that a lot of people like. Um, and I do have Facebook as well. I'm just kind of starting to get onto that one though. Um, I use Instagram um, majority of the time. That's great. Thank you so much for being a guest on the Integrative Health Coach Success Podcast and sharing all your wisdom with us. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it too. (laughs) Our pleasure. We'll be in touch soon. Thanks, Amara. Thank you so much. Bye, Julia.